<laughs> okay, so the next speaker is Jörn Bringmann, and he will talk about wave equations and Brownian models. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for you know having me here. It's uh, you know always nice to speak here. Uh, when preparing this, I assume that you know as much about analysis and probability as I know about algebra, which means you took an analysis <laughs> class in sophomore year. Um, so uh, I'll first start with kind of the scale up setting, uh, which will be very basic. Uh, and then we'll move on to a geometric setting, which is a bit more complicated. Um, so let me first talk, tell you a little bit about this scalar wave equation. Uh, so this is a model that appears kind of all about physics. Uh, you can use it to describe acoustic waves and magnetic waves. If you open a textbook, you'll often find it first if you want to describe the motion of a guitar string. These are kind of the situation where it occurs. There are many other situations as well. Right? Um, so what is this scalar wave equation? Let's consider a real valued function u uh, that depends on uh, time and space. Okay, so time is denoted by t, space by x, and both of these are one-dimensional things. Uh, and the TDE for this, our wave equation, is given by the following equation right here. I want that the second derivative in time is given by the second derivative in space. So these things are supposed to be equal, right? Um, so of course, there's not just one solution to this equation. There are many possible ones. But what is true is that the corresponding initial value problem has a unique solution. So what does it mean? Okay, let's assume that we're given a function u0 that only depends on x and a function u1 that also only depends on x. Then there's a unique solution to this wave equation that has initial position u0 and initial velocity u1. And what this means is that the function at you know, time 0 and position x should be u0x and the time derivative at time 0 and position x should be u1x. Right? So uh, there's a unique, it's uniquely specified by these kind of conditions. Um, so just to give you an idea of what this uh, looks like, let me try to hit this button here and everything works. Okay, so I'll press play in a second. So what you'll see is that, you know, here is the x-axis, which is the same as x. Uh, here's the y-axis, which is the solution. And then the evolution of time, you'll see by, you know, me pressing the play button. Um, so here it goes. Um, and we get this very clean, very simple oscillation. I think I started with the cosine, so I'm only showing you one period. And then you get this very nice harmonic motion at time, right? So pretty simple, would be pretty easy to describe, like oscillates in the middle, oscillates at the end. And and so on. And so this is roughly what wave equations are supposed to do, right? Okay, so let me pause that. Okay, now um, we'll introduce the second player here. Uh, and at least for the next two minutes or so, this is a completely different topic, and then we'll connect up, right? So the second topic is about Brownian motion. Um, this also has a physical origin. So it was first observed by this guy called Robin Brown, and he looked at pollen particles which were suspended in water. And what he realized is that these pollen particles were heavily oscillating. And it's you know very very regular, uh, and this is typically what like physicists or biologists I guess mean by this. Um, when you ask a mathematician, they mean something you know related but maybe a bit different. They mean you know a stochastic process, right? So for a mathematician, what is Brownian motion? Well, a Brownian motion is a function that is random and depends on x, um, which satisfies certain natural probabilistic properties. Okay, so one can define this. You just write on kind of a list of probabilistic conditions that you want. Uh, but this, I think, would be a bit too technical for this talk, right? Um, so I'm not going to give you a precise definition. All I'm going to show you is a picture, right? So this here is a sample of a Brownian motion, and you see that you get these very irregular behaviors, right? So it kind of goes up and down and does so independently of the past, more, more or less, right? Uh, and what I want to highlight is that this is kind of a sample of a Brownian motion. It's not the Brownian motion, right? So if you think of, like, I have a random dice in my hand that I can throw as often as I want, right? But instead of getting a number between 1 and 6, I get a random function. And I kind of threw it once and I got this function, but I could throw it again and we get a different function. Right? So let's connect these two things. Um, so we now want to look at kind of a wave equation with Brown and initial data. Okay, so the question I want to ask is the following. Okay, let's take our initial position, you not as a Brownian motion in X. Then what happens to this Brownian motion as I solve the wave equation? Okay, I should also tell you what the initial velocity is. I'll ignore this for, for now, but this is roughly the, the question, right? And this is somewhat specific, but you can put this into a more general framework. For instance, you know, much more generally, you can ask, okay, I have something that's random. I have some kind of PDE that I then solve. And what happens to this randomness as time goes on, right? Does it become more random, less random? You know, what, what exactly happens here, All right? In this generality, there's no way I could possibly answer this. Depends on the type of randomness, depends on the precise PDE. But, you know, this is kind of one instance of this question, right? Which one can actually, in some sense, answer. One question about you, yeah. maybe X yeah. is in a compact space. Yeah, so I chose periodic data, okay. uh, and therefore I only show you one period. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have gone away. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is what I was expecting. So. Yeah. Uh, not, yeah, so if you don't have any decay, it doesn't have to go away. 
Well, not if you play the, the guitar. <laughs> right? Not if you play the guitar. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. So let's uh, let's look at another video that hopefully illustrates this. So it's pretty much the same videos before. You, know, you see the x-axis, you see the you know solution on the y-axis. All I change is the initial data, right? So we now start with this running motion. But and you need the two data to start. Yes. So the initial velocity is what's white, called white noise. Uh, but because white noise is kind of hard to define, I try to like fool you by not mentioning it. <laughs> so yeah, so the initial velocity has to be white noise, uh, which is as in this in this video. Okay, so let's press play uh, and see what happens. Um, so this is the you know solution of the weight equation with Brownian initial data. I would say it looks a little bit more complicated than the cosine we saw before. Uh, you know, you get these very nice oscillations that go left and right and so on. It's kind of hard to exactly describe what, what you see here. Um, but let me press pause for a second. So if we freeze this, you know, it certainly is not the same function as the one we started with, right? If you were to compare it, but it does kind of look similar, right? It has these oscillations. It didn't really move up or down. It kind of stayed near zero. Like the mean hasn't really changed so much, right? So it looks kind of like what we had before, right? And then I can, of course, press play again. It goes a little bit further and so on. But if I pause it again, you know, it kind of looks like what we had, right? See, it seems to be as irregular. And uh, there's actually a way in which you can make this precise, which I think is quite nice. Uh, so we can put this in a, in a theorem. So let me close the video. Uh, and uh, let's put this in a, in a theorem. So here's the theorem that I call uh, invariance. So let's, uh, you know, you be a brown emotion. Um, to be honest, yeah, it's a periodic brown emotion. So just to address kind of Peter's question. And let you want to be white noise, which I don't really want to define. Okay, so you need to worry about the initial velocity as well. Um, but if you have this, uh, then you can look at the solution of this wave equation. And for every time t, this will again be a run motion. And in fact, the time derivative will also be a white noise. So the law is really invariant on others, right? It doesn't change. Um, so maybe just to connect this to Shira's very nice talk, uh, the reason why you actually might care about proving this is because then you can use the Poincare occurrence term. Uh, so that'd be one of the motivations why you might want to prove this. So yeah, just to describe this again, like of course the solution kind of moves, right? That we, what we saw, but the law doesn't change. It remains a Brownian motion, right? So maybe a few words about the proof. Um, so the proof of this is more or less trivial. So, you know, as long as you have the background in PDE and probability, it's like a two or three line proof. Uh, and that's because you can solve the linear wave equation explicitly uh, and you just calculate everything, right? And kind of the reason why this is so easy is because, well, it's a linear PDE with constant coefficients, right? So these are not so complicated. <clears throat> um, once you go to nonlinear equations, then things become actually quite difficult, right? So if you ask similar questions for nonlinear equations, these are kind of important problems and many of such problems are actually open uh, today, okay? So, Let's kind of leave this as scalar setting. We'll move to like nonlinear equations and the nonlinearity will kind of come from geometry, right? So we'll now move to the geometric setting and this will also be nonlinear. Okay. So um, I first need an analog of the wave equation and then will be the so-called wave maps equation. So just a few words about the setting. I just take a, a really many manifold MG. And what I now want to look at is a function that has two real valued inputs which are still time and space, right? they're just real valued. But the thing that has changed is that I now map into a manifold and I'm no longer real valued, right? So that's where the geometry enters. Um, and then you can write on a natural wave equation in the setting, which is the so-called wave maps equation. And in local coordinates, it looks like this. Right? Uh, so UK are the coordinates. And then the reason why this is a wave equation is because, well, this part of the equation is the same as before, right? But then I have these nonlinear terms right here. Okay, so these gammas here are the Christoffel symbols. It's not so important what they are. Some nonlinear functions of u, uh, and here you have a quadratic derivative nonlinearity, which makes this kind of really hard to deal with. Right? This is somewhat complicated PD. Um, so there are other ways to kind of define this, more intrinsic ones as well. Um, but I just want to show you a picture because I think that it helps. Um, okay, so I would have liked to show you a video, but these are actually really hard to simulate. So the picture is kind of the best I could do. Is it periodic or do you want to be periodic again? So if I give it periodic data, it will stay periodic. Uh, so I think here, you don't see it because it's hidden in the back of the sphere, but I think I gave a periodic data. Um, so here, I think I started with this red curve that you see, and then I let it evolve, which is you know very regular, kind of like the cool thing that we started with, I guess. Uh, and then uh, I kind of computed some solutions here. So these kind of lines in different colors correspond to the solution at different times. And you still see these kind of oscillations. So here it goes up, here it goes down, uh, that are kind of you know the cornerstone of wave equations. So. Right. 
Uh, but now, you know, everything has to lie in this manifold, which is where the linearity comes from. Um, okay, so this is the weight equation. The other thing we'll need is Brownian motion. Uh, so you can actually define Brownian motion on manifolds. Okay, so you, the same setting, you just take a remaining manifold, uh, and there's a natural Brownian motion on this manifold, uh, and I'm not the first person to study this at all. Okay, so this is a very central object in stochastic geometry that has occupied people for decades. Okay, um, maybe just one comment for the experts. All you do in your definition is you change the Laplace operator to the Laplace Brownian operator, and then everything works. Um, so at least in the in the way to define it. Um, again, I didn't give you the definition before. I'm not going to give you the precise definition here. I just have a picture. Um, so here you no longer can see x. So I only plotted like the image of the Brownian motion, right? So each point here that is in red corresponds to some x value, but you don't see exactly what that x is, right? So here I think I started down here, and then you get these very irregular motions. And I think when I stopped the simulation, I was here. Uh, so in fact, I think I don't think this is periodic, but you can do it on the real line as well. Um, so we have our wave maps equation, we have our Brownian motion, now we want to combine them, right? So we want to ask the same question as before. I want to take my initial position to be a Brownian motion of this manifold, and I want to ask myself, okay, what happens to the solution of this wave maps equation with this data? Okay, and that's a kind of difficult question because I have a nonlinear PD and I have a very, very low regularity data, right? You saw how, how irregular it is, right? Um, so there's two theorems on this. Um, the first one was obtained in joint work with Jonas Luhmann and Julia Stafilani about two years ago. And what we were able to do is the following. We just consider a general compact remaining manifold. So we made very few assumptions on the, on the geometry. And we were able to prove what's called local opposeness. Okay, so we were able to show that this solution exists at least locally in time, um, which is kind of the first thing you would want to prove. Right? And for nonlinear PDs, that's very much not trivial. Um, but of course, it's kind of not really the answer to the question we wanted to do, because what we wanted to do was get the analog of the result that we also had in the scalar setting. Right? So we want to prove invariance and also global robustness. So we need to know that the solution exists for all times. Uh, and do we have the same principle that the evolution somewhere does not depend on what yeah, else yeah, are we? Yeah, yeah, so we still have finite speed of propagation, exactly. uh, which enters very heavily into the proof. Actually. Um, so, um, so very recently, so a couple of weeks ago, I was able to prove this. So in a recent paper, we I was able to prove global false invariance. So really kind of the analog of this the theorem that we had before, but I had to make some strong assumptions on the geometry. So I was only able to cover the case where M is a compact Lie group um, with a bi invariant with many metric. Um, no smallness condition. There's no smallness condition. Um, Okay. So what are other conditions to which guarantee you global robustness? Um, in this setting where you take brown initial data, uh, this is, I think, the only thing. Okay. Um, so if you take smooth data, then we know much better. But for this brown initial data, I think that's the only thing. And we need some weak form of telling what solution of the Yes, uh, so that's a very good question. You have to make sense of, well, the derivative itself is not classically defined because it's not differentiable. And then what really gets you is the square, right? So the quadratic linearity. So you have to you know, be very careful on how you find this, but you can give a, give a sense to this. Okay, so that's the theorem. So let me, um, let me end on a slightly different note. So the way I kind of built this talk is I went from one example to the next. Uh, so I, you know that's how I designed it. But I also want to show you just on one slide that there's kind of a bigger picture. Okay, I want to take a slightly broader point of view, um, right? So you know I gave you these specific theorems, but you could really ask questions like this in very very many contexts. Okay, so what we were talking about was kind of the wave equation setting, but you could also just ask about the measure, which in our case was the Brownian motion, but in different questions with the different measures. Uh, you could ask similar questions for stochastic heat equations. Or for Schrodinger equations. Uh, so these would be like the prototypical ones. Um, so we were talking lately uh, about this kind of manifold volume setting. You could also ask questions about the scalar setting. Well, if you have a linear equation, it's not so interesting, but you could add a nonlinearity, like a polytype nonlinearity, then it becomes very interesting. Um, you could move to other geometric settings. So you could look at things that are connection valued, you could look at things that are take values in the space of many metrics, and all of these you could you can study. So basically, like any cell here is really kind of its own research direction and contains actually more than one problem because there are many things you could vary, like the dimension of your domain, for instance. And right? so, uh, so there's a lot that kind of you can relate here. So just to highlight a few things, the talk was here, right? So, so we were talking about wave equations in the manifold body setting. Um, if you were here two years ago, which I at least think all the permanent faculty were, uh, I gave a talk about kind of this setting about two years ago. So just uh, you know to connect this. 
Uh, and let me just end on a name drop. I'm sorry about this. So if you want to uh, study the Yangman's millennium problem, that would be here. Okay, so Yangman's millennium problem is about the construction of one of these measures, more or less. And you know, I think it's fair to say we are very far away from solving that, but I think that's that's okay. Um, yeah, so thank you. Well, you make box every two years. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing you didn't examine us on what he did with the two years ago. Any questions? So, so you're telling you were looking at compact group, but yeah. then you use also things like compact group, modulo, compact subgroup, like the sphere. Uh, that's a good question. I, I think one might be able to. Um, so anything that has like you know constant ish curvature, it's also, I think it, you might be able to do it for spheres. But a general manifold is just compact. Maybe you could say what what about the compact group are you using? Symmetric so, space. Yeah. So 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 one thing that's very convenient when you work in the legal setting is that you do everything at the level of derivatives. Uh, so then you map it to the algebra, so the linear space, which is very nice. Uh, uh, but also, you know, in this business, you often have these kind of resonances that typically lead to things that almost diverge. Uh, and when you're in the legal setting, these are very nice to compute. It's just related to the killing form. Uh, so you get these very clean objects that you can kind of work with. Karen, you had a question. No. Oh, no. <laughs> I have a question. Oh, yes. When you're saying when you're saying uh, local global closeness, is that intended in the probabilistic sense? Yes. Yeah. So what you can what you can show is uh, so local actually is kind of local in space time. So basically, what it says is like you take your so a large interval, so it's like a below the whole real line, and then you can you know solve up to a small time tau, uh, and you, with a probability that the, uh, that gets better as tau goes to zero, okay. exponentially so. Um, yeah. So all of this is probabilistic. Yeah, but but this is all in, in one space, one time. Yeah, so everything here is in one space, yeah, one time. Yeah, so there, you really can't get much of anything if you go up in the dimension, right? Yeah, so uh, for, for this wave maps model, it would be quite difficult to go up to dimension two because that's the energy critical case from the yeah. deterministic theory. Um, but you could study other models. So for instance, like the scalar case, you can do in many dimensions. Ying Mills, you would believe to be able to go up all the way up to four, uh, at least for the parabolic one. Um, but that also we don't really know how to do. So like there we really are. Kind of, we can kind of do dimension two, maybe dimension three, um, depending on what kind of question you ask. Well, well, you, you know, but as long as you're below the scale. Yeah, but um, so the um, the kind of forcing is always so rough that it puts you into regularity that you are below the deterministic scale variance. Parabolic would be very different. Yes, yeah. so get regular. Um, so when you in this kind of setting, when you talk about parabolic equations. You actually always mean the one that has stochastic forcing. So, like the the flow, the domestic flow would be smoothing, but you kind of reinsert randomness at every time, and that kind of keeps it from getting smoother. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so let's thank all our speakers.